Colin Call met with Saudi Vice Minister of Defense, His Royal Highness Prince Khalid bin Salman, to reaffirm the U.S.-Saudi defense relationship. Under Secretary Call emphasized the U.S. commitment to helping Saudi Arabia defend its territory and its people. The two leaders discuss efforts to end the war in Yemen and share the U.S.-Saudi commitment to counter Iran's destabilizing activities. Dr. Call thanked the Vice Minister for working closely and constructively with U.S. Special Envoy Tim Linderking to end the war in Yemen and condemn the Houthi cross-border attacks. The Under Secretary also noted the need to work together on addressing the proliferation and dangers of unmanned aerial vehicles. The Secretary uh, of Defense, Austin, also took the opportunity to take a few moments of the bilateral engagement to express our commitment uh, to our defense relationship with Saudi Arabia and to discuss regional security and stability. The Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, General Milley, also took time uh, to uh, participate in uh, a portion of that meeting uh, with the Saudi Vice Minister. On to uh, Exercise Seabreeze 21. Over the weekend, Ukrainian President Zelensky visited the Arleigh Burke class guided missile destroyer USS Ross to reinforce the bonds of our two nations. Today, USS Ross got back underway, continuing to build our maritime interoperability in the Black Sea. Also in Seabreeze, U.S., Ukrainian, Canadian, Polish, and Georgian divers are working side by side to remove a civilian vessel that sunk in 2016 and is now blocking a portion of the Odessa port pier. This cooperative dive and salvage operation uh, will increase port access and maritime safety, demonstrating the tangible, lasting impacts of our partnerships. And as we've said, exercises like Seabreeze allows participants to learn from each other and strengthen relationships between NATO, allied, and partner nations in the region. Uh, and lastly, as I think you all are aware of the tragic news on Sunday uh, from out of the Philippines. Uh, the secretary did offer his condolences to the government of the Philippines and the families of all those lost uh, in that crash in Sulu. We'll, uh, we will continue to provide uh, whatever support uh, the Philippine government uh, needs uh, in, in, to, to respond to this uh, tragedy. The secretary is scheduled tonight to speak on the phone with the Secretary of National Defense uh, of the Philippines, Delphin Lorenzana, and certainly we'll provide a readout of that call af after it happens, but that's, that's the schedule now. Okay, we'll go to questions. Uh, looks like, Lita, you're up. Hi, John, thanks. Uh, two things. Um, one, can you um, say on the meeting with KBS, was there any discussion about any specific requests that the Saudis have for anything from the United States, including um, noting the recent withdrawal of some uh, patriots from their country. And then secondly, on Afghanistan, uh, General Miller is at NATO. Can you talk a little bit about his message to, um, to the NAC and to um, Stoltenberg today and whether he's gonna be doing any other diplomatic meetings over the coming days? I don't have any additional detail on the the meeting uh, with the Saudi Vice Minister of Defense, other than what I just read out to you. I mean, uh, clearly they talked about a range of um, of security interests there uh, in Saudi Arabia, and as I said, uh, from our side, we reaffirmed uh, the Saudis' uh, right and responsibility capability to defend the, themselves uh, and their territorial integrity from these uh, these Houthi attacks, particularly UAV attacks. Uh, and we take our commitment to helping the Saudis contribute to that self-defense very, very seriously. So I, I think I'll just leave it at that. Um, as for uh, General Miller's uh, visit to Brussels, it was, uh, uh, you may have seen the Secretary General Stoltenberg uh, issued a, a tweet after that meeting was over. It was very much an opportunity for the general to update uh, uh, the Secretary General on uh, the progress of the drawdown and of the coming uh, authority, I'm sorry, command authority uh, changes that uh, that I briefed you on on Friday. Uh, and I would really refer more t to, uh, to NATO and, and the Secretary General to speak in more detail of uh, reading out that uh, that meeting. But again, as I, and I, uh, I, I said this on Friday. I mean, we can expect uh, over the next week or so, as we get ready to do this transition of authority, that uh, General Miller may be moving in and around uh, the, the the theater and elsewhere uh, to prepare for the proper uh, uh, transition over to, to General McKenzie. And this visit to uh, the NATO was was part of that. It's also, you know, we need to uh, remind that the Operation Resolute Support still exists. 
he is still the commander of Operation Resolute Support. It is not uh, uncommon or atypical for him to brief uh, NATO leaders about uh, about his activities uh, in, in that role as the commander of Operation Resolute Support. As for additional travel, I'm not going to get ahead of his schedule. I think you can all understand why we wouldn't do that. Uh, but as we get closer to this transition of authority uh, from General Miller to General uh, McKenzie, we'll certainly uh, keep you updated uh, to the degree we can. Tom. John, can you walk us through what happened at Bagram? The Afghan military is saying the U.S. left in the dead of night, didn't inform them. Looters broke in, grabbed a lot of stuff. And there's also reports that left behind were hundreds of armored and unarmored vehicles. Yeah, so I mean, I've seen those press reports, Tom. Uh, what I can tell you is that there was coordination with Afghan leaders, uh, both in the government as well as in the Afghan security forces, uh, about the eventual turnover of Bagram Air Base. As you know, it was the seventh and the final base uh, that we turned over. Uh, to the Afghan National Security Forces. You don't do that in a vacuum, and this wasn't done in a vacuum. I can't speak for the level uh, of information that, that, uh, that went down the Afghan chain of command, but I can tell you that Afghan leaders, civilian and military, were appropriately coordinated with and briefed about the turnover of Bagram uh, Air Base. Uh, in, in, in fact, some of that briefing uh, included a, a walkthrough uh, of facilities on the base with senior Afghan leaders. Was that with civilian and aviation authority people? A big pardon? Was that with the civilian aviation authority people? I don't know the details of that. I do know that there was a walkthrough of the facilities with senior Afghan leaders. Did you say when and that was done? I, just let me finish. The, the, uh, the, the, conversa the, the, the specific conversation and coordination about the turnover of Bakram, uh, the, the final conversations occurred about 48 hours prior. Obviously, for operational security reasons, we didn't go into the exact hour at which uh, all U.S. forces would, would leave Bagram. Again, as I said from the outset, we have had to operate under the assumption that this uh, drawdown could be contested at any time. And so we're very careful about uh, what we say and how, how much detail we provide out there. But there was coordination. Now, as to exactly who, um, I'd refer you to uh, General Miller's staff for the, the, the more, more details on that. But uh, there was coordination done at, at uh, higher levels in the government and the Afghan forces. It was done in plenty of time. And it's not like the closure or the turnover of Bagram was uh, at all in dispute throughout this drawdown process. Uh, everybody knew that was happening, and, uh, and there was general understanding about roughly when, again, as we got closer, uh, more detail was provided to, to Afghan leaders. And as far as what was left behind, were there armored vehicles? Uh, there have been reports of hundreds of armored and unarmored vehicles left behind in Bagram. There were some vehicles obviously left behind and some turned over to Af Afghan officials. Again, I'd refer you to uh, Resolute Support and, uh, and General Miller's staff for more detail on exactly how many and, and in what condition they were. But yes, there were some vehicles. Uh, and that's, again, that hasn't, that's not uncommon with some of the other turnovers of other, other facilities that, uh, that we've had. Okay. Are. Thanks, John. Um, another on Bagram. The, each of the statements that has been released by the Defense Department has said that all the equipment being brought out were non-defense articles. Um, after the reports of the vehicles being left at Bagram, have, are we leaving a bunch of military equipment behind for the Afghan army? And uh, the Defense Department today also said that 90 percent of the drawdown or withdrawal is complete. Um, at that point, is basically everything that's left just at Kabul now? I wouldn't, uh, I don't, uh, I'd, let me check on that one. I think I'd try to go to CENTCOM on your last question before I try to speculate. But um, I think uh, in terms of the equipment left behind, no weapons are being left behind. Uh, throughout the drawdown, a few hundred small arms and ammunition were transferred uh, to the ANDSF. And again, I think CENTCOM can provide you a little bit more uh, detail on, on that. Okay. What about the vehicles? Uh, again, I don't have a full breakdown of, <clears throat> of the vehicles. Uh, some vehicles were left for use by the Afghans. Some were destroyed uh, because they were no longer uh, usable. Uh, and some were properly uh, transferred out of the country. Uh, some brought home, some transferred to other places uh, in the region.
just okay, follow. But I don't have I don't have a breakdown of every vehicle. I just okay. don't have that Separate level of topic. detail. Um, this weekend, uh, Derzor, did it come under attack or not come under attack? I, I think we I think we put something out over the weekend that that there were there was no attack on Derzor. Okay. No, that was disinformation of some sort, but there was no attack. Look, John, if more than 90% of the U.S. troops are out of Afghanistan, why don't you just declare the mission over? Are you stalling to get the interpreters out? What the CENTCOM statement said was 90% of the withdrawal was complete. Um, we have refrained from the very beginning speaking about uh, specific numbers of people. Again, for valid operational security reasons. I'm not going to break that precedent today. Uh, as I said on Friday, uh, the drawdown continues. And as I also said on Friday, we expect it to be complete by the end of August. Um, clearly, uh, when you look at the percentage that CENTCOM put out, 90 percent uh, complete, it tells you that our presence is small, both materially and physically, in terms of people. Uh, but I'm simply not going to get beyond what CENTCOM has, has provided, begin, again, because we have to assume that as this withdrawal continues throughout the summer, that it could be contested, and we don't want to see anybody get hurt. You also said Friday that you're not speeding up the withdrawal. Does that mean you're delaying the withdrawal in order to get the interpreters it out? It means the withdrawal is on pace, and we will we will be out by the end of August, which is uh, a slightly ahead, slightly ahead uh, of what the, the the president's original direction was, but but not not so far ahead that I that I and I pushed back on you on Friday, not so far ahead that I would indicate that it's being radically sped up. It isn't being slowed down. No, it's not being slowed down. It, it is it is it is occurring on on pace. And again, there's there's still work to be done here uh, on this drawdown as we get as we get uh, through the summer. Let me take one from the phone. I, I know we've got lots of hands up. Uh, Carla Bab. Um, thanks, John. Let me go back to Bagram really quickly. Um, the reports are saying the the new commander was not notified. I mean, would you not say that that's a huge oversight either by um, DOD or the Afghans? Somebody forgot to tell this commander um, because he's telling reporters that he didn't know until after the U.S. forces had left. So is that not a big oversight? And then I have a couple follows. I, I can't dispute the reporting that you've seen there. I'm certainly not going to. Uh, uh, I'm not in a position to to, to publicly uh, dispute uh, the commander's comments to to press. I can't speak for how Afghan leadership uh, briefed their people. What I can tell you is that there was coordination between uh, General Miller and his staff and senior Afghan military and civilian leaders about the turnover of Bagram. Uh, that I know. Uh, and that there was, uh, the, even to the degree of there being a walkthrough. Now, what, what this commander knew and when he knew it, uh, I simply can't speak to that. Okay. Um, then also, we've heard the reports that the electricity was shut off. Uh, and that allowed looters to enter, which doesn't sound safe or orderly, which is what the US, U.S. has been saying. And you've said from that podium many times about having a safe and orderly withdrawal. So why was the electricity shut off and was the U.S. responsible for that? Well, that's a, a question that's better put to people on the ground there in mm -hmm. Afghanistan. I, I, don't, I don't have that level of fidelity of, of information in terms of the exact tick-tock of, of, of how the base was, uh, was turned over. So I, I really would refer you to them for more detail a, about that. Yeah. yeah Thanks. Uh, John, could you update us on how the Afghanistan mission will be conducted from over the horizon, uh, including support for the Afghan <coughs> our, uh, Air Force? Is there anything more on that? Uh, as we've said, Abraham, we're still, we are capable of conducting over the horizon counterterrorism right now. Um, it's difficult, but it's doable. Uh, and we are continuing to explore other options in the region to be able to enhance that capability going forward. We are having active discussions in concert with our State Department colleagues uh, about that very thing. I don't have a breakdown for you right now what that's going to look like. But again, it's important to remember we already have an over-the-horizon counterterrorism capability. We've got the uh, a carrier strike group in the region. We've got uh, facilities throughout the, the Middle East uh, that have and will continue to be of value in this regard, so we have that capability. Um, as for the support for uh, the Afghans, uh, we're, we're still working out what that contract support's going to look like uh, once the drawdown is complete. 
many of those contractors are still there providing that kind of support to the Afghans and the Afghan Air Forces uh, as you and I speak. And, uh, and we are actively working uh, ways in which that contract support can be done remotely or virtually or even physically outside the country. John, if I may, on the Black Sea exercises, uh, while Sea Breeze is going on, while NATO had some aerial exercises happening, Russia was doing uh, S-400 tests, and they were also uh, practicing uh, bombing uh, mock enemy ships. Uh, were these Russian exercises uh, announced in advance? Was there a deconfliction? Um, did they interfere at all with the U.S. exercises happening in the Black Sea? There's no interference in, with, with exercise Seabreeze. I'd refer you to our, our colleagues in Moscow to speak about the degree to which uh, they coordinated uh, those exercises. We're focused on Seabreeze, and Seabreeze has gone off quite well uh, and uh, continues, to, continues to be an so active exercise. What a problem for the U.S.? I know of no uh, uh, infringement on our ability to exercise in Seabreeze uh, by, by Russian activity. Yeah, more. Uh, two questions. If the first 90 percent of the withdrawal took two months, why is the last 10 percent taking two more months? And then can you update us on the border mission and the extension of National Guard troops? For uh, on the first question, Oren, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not a linear process. Um, and I think you guys were uh, critical of some of the updates uh, previously in the in the summer that the percentages didn't change much from week to week. It's not a linear process. Uh, Ninety percent uh, means 90 percent, but that, that means there's still 10 percent to do. And as you get smaller um, in both force size and in capability, uh, that uh, that capability, those those resources need to be marshaled even more carefully. Um, because as you as you begin to, to whittle down, so that's where we're at right now. Uh, it, it's we're on pace, on schedule, and I think we'll be done by the end of August. But you, you, I think it would should be logical that as you get smaller, uh, again, you want to marshal those resources uh, much more carefully as you as you press forward. Um, on your second question, Southwest border. So the, the secretary did approve uh, an extension of uh, DOD personnel to support the Southwest Border Mission into the next fiscal year. For fiscal year uh, 22, it's uh, an authorization to support it for up to 3,000 personnel. Yeah. Yes, sir. John, thank you. Good uh, to see you, my friend. Thank you, sir. Been a while. Thank you, sir. Uh, the Afghan civilians are worried about, after the U.S. Uh, leaving Afghanistan, about their uh, sec uh, safety and security. Mm -hmm. So what they are saying that they were better off with the U.S. forces there, and now Taliban will come, and they are fearing their lives, uh, uh, common Afghans in Afghanistan. Now, second, what role do you think you, uh, India will play as far as military role is concerned if, if uh, Pentagon had any uh, conversation with the Indian military officials, uh, what their role will be there, and finally, any U.N. role? Okay, I don't have any. I don't have any updates on the UN. I'd let them speak uh, for themselves, uh, and I think I'd give you a similar answer on, on India. We have certainly had discussions, as you know. One of our first stops on international travel was to New Delhi. Uh, I, I would let the Indian government speak to whatever role they want to uh, and relationship they want with Afghanistan going forward. That would be inappropriate for us to speak to, but but certainly they have. Uh, as uh, as a nation there in that region, they have concerns. They have uh, they have equities, uh, and we respect that. They would have to speak for that. And and on your first point about safety and security of the Afghan people, obviously we we're mindful of these concerns. Uh, but as the president has made clear, our troops accomplished the mission for which they were deployed to Afghanistan. It is not. Uh, we have not suffered an attack on the homeland from Afghanistan, and the president's made clear that one of the reasons we're going to keep this over-the-horizon counterterrorism capability is to prevent it from becoming a safe haven for attacks on our homeland again, and that's the focus right now. We have spent a, a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of resources in improving the competency and the capability of the Afghan National Security Forces, and now it's their turn. It's their time to, to, to defend their people, defend their territory, defend their sovereignty. Uh, and it's really, it's going to be up to them now uh, uh, to, to do the work uh, of, uh, of the security forces for, for that particular country. Many Afghans who fled Afghanistan 20 years ago, and they have a painful memories here, and they have families also back home. 
because of the Taliban and uh, Al Qaeda and Osama bin Laden and among others, and they are now fearing and they are still now asking the U.S., uh, especially the Pentagon, what message you think Secretary will have for them? I think the, me the message that we have as a government uh, to them is that we st we still are going to be a partner to the Afghan people and to the Afghan government going forward. That partnership, that relationship is going to look different than it has over the last 20 years. Uh, and, and that means it's going to be financial support. And you've heard the president uh, make some announcements about that. It'll be over the horizon support in terms of logistical and technical and uh, aviation maintenance support. Uh, but our commitment to the future of a uh, uh, of a stable and a secure Afghanistan has not changed. It's going. To, it's just going to look different. We're just not going to be on the ground the way we are now. Thanks, sir. Yeah. Let me uh, go to the phones. Uh, uh, Stephen Losey, Military.com. Hi. Uh, can you talk a little bit about what the uh, Pentagon is planning to do regarding the COVID vaccine once the FDA uh, fully approves it? Are there preparations in the works for making it uh, mandatory once FDA approval does come through? I want to get ahead of the FDA. Um, it, right now, it's being used under emergency youth authorization, which makes it a voluntary vaccine. Should the FDA approve it, then I am certain that Pentagon leadership will take a look at what our options are going forward, including the potential option uh, of making mandatory. But I'm not going to get too far ahead of process right now. It is an FDA. It is not FDA approved, uh, and therefore. Uh, it is still a voluntary vaccine. I would like to add that as we speak, almost 69 uh, percent of DOD personnel have received at least one dose. That's not bad. So we, uh, we, we got work to do, clearly. Uh, we'd like to see that percentage continue to climb. Uh, but it is, it's at a healthy 68.8 percent, I think, as of uh, today. So uh, uh, we, we want to keep encouraging uh, our people and their families to get the vaccines. They're safe, they're effective, uh, and it's really the best incentive to protect you, your families, uh, and your teammates. But are there communications going out telling uh, divisions within the military to prepare for such a mandatory decision? Should the uh, approval. I think there's been there, there's been some preliminary uh, discussions uh, at senior levels at, at, within the department to uh, uh, to think about uh, what the next logical steps would be uh, if and when FDA approval uh, comes in. We're a planning organization. Uh, I don't think that should surprise anybody uh, that we're trying to f uh, think about what the implications would be and how we would how would react to that. But I don't have any decisions to announce today or specific. Uh, procedures and protocols to speak to. It is still uh, in a, uh, under emergency use authorization, and it is still a voluntary vaccine. Again, a vaccine we we vaccines of which we believe are safe and effective, uh, and we encourage everybody to uh, to get them if they haven't already. Uh, let me go to Tony Capaccio from Bloomberg. Hi, hey John. Two questions. So one Afghan, one unrelated. On the cybersecurity uh, announcement that was made today on on Jedi. What involvement did Secretary Austin have in the final decision to uh, recalibrate the whole contract? Well, I mean, the secretary, as, as Secretary of Defense, uh, was obviously the final approval of this decision. Okay. So he made final approval of the decision. All right. A second subject. Your chief information security officer, Katie Arrington, her attorney last week acknowledged that she's on administrative leave for some und potential undisclosed, unauthorized disclosure of classified information, yet to this date, she does not know the charges against her. Can you give some, can you comment on that at all? Will DOD lay out what she's exactly accused of to at least her and her attorney? Uh, Tony, all I, all I can tell you is uh, that, uh, that, that this individual is on leave, and uh, I'm really not at liberty to go beyond that right now. All right. When she, when a final decision is made, can you uh, consider laying out what happened? The, given her high profile, she was the face of the Department's cybersecurity initiatives. So I, I think it's only fair you lay out what happened to her a, uh, at the end of the at the end of the review. I, I can't promise uh, how much detail we're going to be able to provide, uh, Tony. Again, I, I, I'm simply not able to, to to comment further than I already have on this. Janie, thank you, John. Um, I think you may have seen the report uh, last weekend that the South Korean military successfully uh, 
launched an underwater launcher SLBM. Somebody launched the ballistic missile. What would you like to comment on this? I, I'm, I'm, I'm not seen? going to comment on that. Um, that's the, uh, our South Korean allies can speak to their capabilities, and I think that's appropriate for them. Uh, I, again, you've heard me say so many times we take our security commitments to the alliance very, very seriously. Um, and we're always looking at ways to in, uh, improve and sharpen our interoperability uh, and the capabilities that the alliance can uh, can put into the into the field and into the fleet uh, to um, to defend the security of the Korean Peninsula. I think I leave it at that. Why why you not comment to this? Because this you know that's very important because North Korea have SLBM already, but the, you yeah. know, again the, the, this deterrence against the North Korea. Again, I think this is more appropriate for. Our our South Korean allies to speak to their individual military capabilities, not for us to. Another question is, do we have any uh, thing about the uh, U.S. and Australia, South Korea and Japan join maritime exercises? Uh, they were starting uh, July 5th to 10th. Uh, do you I have anything on that? don't think I have anything on that. Uh, I'm missing a lot of things. Thank you. It's always good to hear that. Let me just check and see. I don't have anything on that, so we'll take the question and we'll get back to you. In the Pacific areas, they have some uh, big exercises. In the Pacific area, area, Chris. Yes. Yes. We'll check on that. I'll check on that. <laughs> I don't have anything for you. That's a your job. No, you're right. And I, I, every time. I call on you. I'm reminded of how I'm failing at my job, <laughs> and, and now it's public out there. So I appreciate I appreciate the uh, the reminder. Idris from Reuters. Hey, John. Um, you, you mentioned that the U.S. didn't specifically give an hour, for example, when you know you would be departing Bagram. But can you say? Did you at least say we're leaving on day X or day Y, or was it just broader saying? We're going to do the walkthrough 48 hours before, and then we're going to leave at some point. And, and, and a follow-up to that is, is what is it? The critics will argue that it sort of speaks to the fact and the trust between the U.S. and Afghan militaries that you can't even let them know when you're departing the largest U.S. base. Um, and how does that, and that it bodes very poorly going forward. Um, how would you sort of respond to those criticisms? I, again, Idris, I'd, I'd tell you that there, there was notification at the higher hi, higher levels of uh, Afghan military and, and civilian government about our the turnover of, of Bagram. I mean, it, 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 we're we're the, the lexicon we keep that, that I keep hearing about Bagram is you know we we turned out the light and left. It, it was a turnover, just like the previous six bases were turned over. Uh, and so there were turnover discussions with Afghan leaders. I can't speak for every conversation that happened. I certainly can't give you an exact day on the calendar uh, that that uh, you know that that was provided. But uh, as I said, uh, some 48 hours before, uh, there was there was there were ample discussions about the turnover of the base to include a walkthrough uh, of facilities. So so it wasn't done you know, in some sort of shroud of, of secrecy. Um, and as for the uh, n not being able to to specifically provide the hour or hours of, of departure, again, I think you would all understand w why we would do it that way. It's not, it's, it's not a statement about whether we trust or don't trust uh, uh, our, our Afghan partners. It's a statement of the fact that we have to consider that this drawdown could be contested uh, by the, the Taliban, and we have to take that in consideration. It would have been irresponsible, and, and I would expect you to challenge us if we had been so specific as to give, you know, the exact hour uh, as, our, as our troops were, were, uh, were turning over that base and, and, and leaving. That, that, would have, that would not have been a prudent thing to do. Uh, but again, we, we have to assume, and we're going to continue to assume. Um, that at any point the drawdown can be contested, and it would again be irresponsible if we didn't do it that way. Yeah. In Iraq, John, uh, Assad base again was under attack yesterday, I believe, yesterday. And also, there were also some engagements to arm drone over Green Zone. 
Do you have anything about that? We've, I think we've already talked about this. Uh, uh, there were two separate rocket attacks uh, in, in Iraq. Uh, uh, as you, I think OIR released a statement that at approximately 2.45 uh, local time, Al-Assad Air Base was attacked by three rockets. The rockets landed on the base perimeter, no injuries. Uh, the damage is still being assessed. Uh, I think OIR uh, uh, Inherent Resolve will be able to provide more updates. Um, and... Uh, as the, the State Department released uh, earlier this morning, defensive systems at the U.S. Embassy combat in Baghdad engaged and eliminated an airborne threat. Uh, the embassy is working with our Iraqi partners to investigate and will continue to take all appropriate measures to protect our staff and our facilities. Whose capabilities were I, I don't have attribution at this point. Uh, we're obviously, uh, our State Department uh, are working with our Iraqi partners on that, on, on the Green Zone uh, incident. and. Uh, as I said, uh, our Iraqi partners are looking at al-Assad as well, and I think inherent resolve, as more information becomes available, we'll certainly be able to provide that to you. But in terms of specific attribution, I, I can't give that to you right now. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have two separate questions. First, I want to follow up on Afghanistan. Uh, w when the president announced his plan to withdraw the troops from Afghanistan, he argued the United States should focus more on the current challenges, such as China. So I'm wondering how the pullout from Afghanistan will benefit the Biden administration's policy toward China from the military perspective. What are the things that, that the pullout will allow the United States to do on China? It's, uh, it's about uh, a focus. It's about focusing on uh, uh, what we believe continue to be uh, the biggest security challenges that we're facing. Um, uh, the, the, uh, we, we just aren't seeing uh, significant terrorist threats emanating out of Afghanistan the way they used to. Uh, obviously, we remain committed to not letting that happen again. We, ha we have and will explore additional capabilities to ensure that. Uh, but it's really about focusing on what we believe as a country are, are, are bigger national security challenges. Uh, and frankly, that includes the pacing challenge that, that China poses, as well as challenges that, that, that we see coming out of Russia. Uh, so it's, it's really a, a, a focusing of our, of our energy and our resources on, on the, the challenges that we believe are most relevant to the American people from a national security perspective. Uh, the second question. Uh, that yesterday, the Japanese Deputy Prime Minister publicly said Japan and the United States need to defend Taiwan if Taiwan is invaded by China. So could you give us a sense of where Japan and United States are now regarding the policy coordination for the Taiwan Strait contingency? Uh, look, I'll, let the, I'll let the Japanese government uh, speak to their comments. Uh, what I would tell you is nothing has changed about our policy with respect to, to Taiwan. Uh, we continue to observe the one China policy and recognize that uh, in accordance with the three communiques, the six assurances, and of course the Taiwan Relations Act. We also remain committed to helping Taiwan defend itself. Uh, again, with bipartisan support over many decades uh, from Congress on that. Nothing's changed about that. And the last thing I'd say is nobody wants to see uh, uh, the situation uh, uh, dissolve into, into conflict, uh, and there's no reason for it to. Uh, so we're focused on making sure that Taiwan uh, can continue to defend itself, uh, and uh, obviously separate and distinct from Taiwan altogether. Uh, the Secretary's made clear uh, that, uh, that in the Indo Pacific region, uh, we've got to continue to pursue what he calls integrated deterrence, which is about netting our capabilities and our, uh, our uh, resources together across the joint force, but also working with our allies and partners. And that certainly includes Japan, South Korea, uh, Australia, many other partners in the region. So in terms of policy coordination, are you still at the early stage or are you well prepared for the continuity? At what, at what stage? Uh, early stage. Uh, in terms of the policy coordination with allies such as Japan, are you at the early stage? Early, of, uh, early stage. Early stage. Yeah. Early stage. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Look, I, I don't want to get into hypotheticals here with respect to Taiwan. Um, uh, we have uh, alliance commitments with Japan that we take very, very seriously. Uh, one of the reasons why it was 
the first stop on uh, on the secretary's first international trip uh, to Tokyo. Uh, I'm not going to speculate about potential conflict in, in any one part of the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, we work closely with uh, our, our Japanese uh, allies. Uh, for lots of good reasons uh, in the region. And again, nothing's changed about our policy with respect to Taiwan. I appreciate where you want the question to go, but where we don't, we, what we don't want to see is any need for this to uh, uh, dissolve into conflict. Uh, the, the, we want to, we want to, uh, again, adhere to the one China policy, uh, and uh, we don't want uh, any unilateral changes in, in the situation with respect to Taiwan. Again, our commitment is to making sure that Taiwan can continue to defend itself. Courtney. I just want to make sure I understand the, the Bagram thing. So you're saying that the reason that the U.S. didn't inform the Afghans and the Afghan government of the exact time that the U.S. was going to leave Bagram is because of the concern about the Taliban and the, the potential for Americans to be, to, I guess, come under attack as they were leaving? What I would say is the, the exact hour of departure uh, was not divulged for operational security purposes we, because we want to, again, the first, when we talk about this drawdown, we talk about it being safe and orderly. Safe's the first word. Um, and for operational security reasons, and that's not different, Court, than other turnovers we've done in the past in Afghanistan. But you're saying you didn't, didn't divulge it to the Afghan military or the Afghan government when the U.S. was leaving the base. Is that correct? That's, That's correct. correct. So the concern is that the Afghans would have potentially, who, I mean, this, the Afghans would have been the I think, I think, partner. I think in general we felt it was just better to keep that information uh, as close hold as possible. So, I mean, you, you, you see the signal or the, the, that that sends to the Afghans that the concern is that by notifying them when the U.S. is turning a base over to them, that, that it's yeah. going to get to the Taliban. Like, I mean, you, you can understand where the... I, I can't speak for how the Afghans interpreted that decision, uh, but it was a decision made in the best interest of, uh, of the safety and security of our people. Thanks. Can I do a quick follow-up to that? If it's safe and orderly, why don't you hand the keys to someone? I beg your pardon? Oh, if it's a safe and orderly transition of the Bagram Air Force Base, wouldn't you hand the keys to somebody? I'm not really sure I understand your question, Abraham. I, I'm not crazy about the tone in which you've asked it, but I also don't understand like what you're trying to say. Oh, the keys to what? The, the base, the Bagram Air Base. We did turn over the base to Afghan leaders, a Abraham. I don't, I've said it now three times in this briefing, uh, and there was a walk through a facility. So I'm not really sure I understand what you mean by keys being turned over. Yeah. Thank Go you, ahead. Tuna uh, Shanla from TRT Turkish Radio Television. Uh, you just said that it is time for Afghan national security forces to defend their people, defend their territory, and defend their sovereignty. And it is their time to do the work of the security forces. So my question is, if they fail to defend their country, what is the plan B for the United States? Uh, can you be more specific about the partnership between the United States and Afghan government? And will it be more uh, military partnership? And finally, Will the U.S. continue to keep some, one of its food in Afghanistan? One of its what? Food in Afghanistan. Uh, feet, 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 yeah. feet, uh, feet, given, feet. Uh, yeah. yeah, given that uh, s small amount of troops will continue to stay in Afghanistan permanently. So uh, the president's been clear. We're going to draw down uh, our troops out of Afghanistan. Uh, that it's that he has he's made clear. It's it's time to end this war, and it's time for the Afghan government, the Afghan people, the Afghan forces, uh, uh, to defend their sovereignty and, uh, and their people. And that's the direction that we're moving in. Um, but he also made clear that we're still going to have a bilateral relationship with Afghanistan. And from a DOD perspective, we're still going to have a relationship with Afghan forces. It'll be over the horizon. It'll take place in a different way. We're not going to have um, boots on the ground, if you will, advising and assisting them in, in, in real operations. But, but that relationship will still exist. We're not turning our back on the country of Afghanistan or the Afghan people. Uh, but it's time now for us to complete this mission and for the Afghan forces uh, to defend their own people and, the, and, the, and again, their, their sovereignty. Uh, Can I ask a follow-up question yeah. to that? Uh, because uh, General Austin Scott Miller just said that last week, I mean. 
There's a path to civil war which is visible. This should be a concern for the world. And if Taliban takes over the government, this should be a concern, especially for the United States, because the United States homeland is yeah. under, uh, it means that the homeland uh, will be under threat. So that's why I asked that question. Will the United States keep one of its feet on the ground? The only, the, the only presence that will remain in Afghanistan once our drawdown is complete is that which is required to protect our diplomatic mission there because we want to be able to keep an embassy. We want to be able to keep the programs and policies that our diplomats are pursuing in Afghanistan uh, vibrant. So the only force presence will be there. To, the, the only force presence there will be designed to help support the diplomatic presence. <clears throat> and as for, you know, uh, if the Taliban take over, that's a big if. That's a hypothetical. And I don't think it's helpful for anybody right now to engage in hypothesizing about wh what, you know, what might happen, uh, you know, in months and years from now. Our focus is on completing this drawdown in a safe and orderly way, in transitioning to a new relationship with the Afghan forces so that they can continue to do the work of defending their people and their sovereignty. And that's where, that's what we're, we're focused on right now. Thank you. Yeah. Let me go back to the phones. I, I'm not been good about that. Uh, Adam Mori, Military Times. I didn't have the questions. Okay. That's right. There's a no next to your name, but it was highlighted. So when you use a highlighted. <laughs> All right. We'll go to Jeff Shogel, Task and Purpose. Thank you very much. I was hoping you could elaborate on your previous answers on Bagram. How much was the concern of a green on blue attack? Uh, how much did that factor into the decision not to tell the Afghan government exactly when uh, Bagram would be turned over? Thanks, Jeff. I think I'm going to leave my answer the way I left it with court, that uh, the decision was made solidly in keeping with uh, uh, our concern for the safety and security of our people as, uh, as they left Bagram. And I think I'm just going to leave it at that. Thank you. And Jen Psaki said at today's White House press briefing, uh, she deferred a question about why the U.S. military turned off the electricity and the water at Bagram to the Defense Department. Is that something you can provide an answer to? That we, I got that question earlier. I don't have that level of detail. Uh, I've seen the press reporting about the electricity being turned off. I, I'm not seeing press reporting about uh, the water, but uh, I'll tell you what I'll do because I don't have that level of detail. We'll take the question and see if we have more detail on that. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, two items in the readout uh, with the meetings of uh, Prince Khalid uh, with the um, leadership uh, at the Pentagon. Uh, one is the, uh, I'm seeking more details if possible, uh, the coordination between the US, uh, the U.S. and Saudi commitment to counter Iran destabilization activities. The other one, if more details is available also, is it seems that uh, every time that there is a meeting and a readout, there is an issue about the UAVs. And it's been like coming increasing. That's my um, impression. Uh, are you feeling that there is an increase of danger because of those UAVs? I, I don't. All you have to look is look at uh, your own press reporting uh, to see that uh, UAVs are becoming increasingly weapons of choice here, um, and uh, and a threat to not only us and our people, but to uh, to our friends and partners in the region. Uh, there's no question about that. And, you know, I'd point you back a couple of weekends ago when, uh, when President Biden ordered some retaliatory strikes, uh, one in Iraq and two facilities in, in Syria. They were structures, they were facilities that were directly tied to this UAV threat, both in terms of how those UAVs were commanded and controlled, as well as how they were maintained and the logistical support for them. So, yeah, it is becoming an increasing threat, and we're all mindful of that. Okay, I, I really got to get to the phones. Hang on just a second. Go ahead. I may have missed this, but it didn't seem like there was an announcement before the vice minister's arrival today. Um, that he was coming, and usually we get, you know, a heads up so can cover it. Was that on purpose, or is that did I just? I think we did put an advisory out that he was coming. I'm pretty sure we did, didn't we? Well, uh, I don't think. I don't have a good answer if we didn't. Okay. Sorry. Um, so I have a question. Uh, 
why isn't the Pentagon and Cyber Command taking down these Russian cyber criminals so that they can't, you know, hold the West hostage? Uh, look, Lucas, I mean, we're all mindful of the, uh, of the, the, the threat, uh, cyber threats coming, emanating out of Russia, and uh, the president has already announced some measures uh, with respect to that. We believe, uh, and we said it before, that uh, a, a, a U.S. Response to those threats has got to be whole of government. It's got to be across the interagency and not just residing in one in one building in one one agency. Because our Eve was fleeced already, uh, the largest meat supplier in the world of 11 million dollars. Now they want 70 million dollars for uh, taking out some uh, Swedish groceries and some other stuff. Isn't yep. it time Cybercom takes these guys <laughs> offline like I, today? I, I'm not going to talk about specific cyber capabilities that are resident here at the department, uh, and I think you can understand that uh, we are all mindful of these growing threats uh, to national security as well as to civilian infrastructure. Uh, and that's why DOD is part of a larger whole of government effort to try to deal with this issue. And a quick football question. Uh, How do we get from cyber to football? That's what we do here in the Pentagon. <laughs> has the defense secretary allowed a uh, uh, recent graduate of the Naval Academy, Cameron Kinley, to attend training camp with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers? Yeah, I've seen, I saw your tweet on this. I have no uh, announcements or decisions to speak to right now about that. Yeah, in the back there. Hi, John. Uh, has the U.S. made any progress on potentially securing uh, basing access in either Tajikistan or Uzbekistan? And will that factor into the discussions or meeting between SECDEF Austin uh, and uh, his Turkish <coughs> counterpart tomorrow? Uh, he looks forward to speaking to his Turkish counterpart tomorrow. I won't get ahead of that, uh, the agenda for that uh, discussion, uh, but clearly I think it's safe to assume that uh, Afghanistan uh, will be top on the list. Uh, as you saw, we had conversations last week with uh, the foreign ministers of both Uzbekistan and Tajikistan, who also met with uh, uh, the State Department as well. I won't detail the specifics of those conversations, but clearly we are and continue to have uh, conversations with leaders in neighboring nations uh, about the kinds of possibilities for support that they can offer uh, with respect to a, a range of uh, over-the-horizon capabilities we want to be able to, to, to bring to bear in our support to the Afghan forces. And when there's something specific that we can announce and speak to, we certainly will. And can, can, can you confirm that uh, Secretary Austin will be meeting in person with uh, his Turkish counterpart tomorrow, or is that a virtual meeting? Uh, I believe it's going to be a phone conversation. Yeah. Yes. Hi. Um, the reports from the ground in Afghanistan suggest the Taliban continue to make uh, progress and uh, take over more districts. And the Afghan military said they are preparing a counter uh, strike or a, a, a movement to, to counter that. Uh, my question is sort of in between Bagram and the, other, the longer term, is what is the Defense Department doing in the next few weeks, the next <clears throat> few months, specifically to help the Afghan military uh, conduct their, their fight against the Taliban? What I would tell you is, as I mentioned on Friday, General Miller still has all the existing authorities he had before in terms of uh, coming to the assistance and the defense of Af Afghan National Security Defense Forces. When he transfers that command authority over uh, in some days' time to General McKenzie, General McKenzie will possess all those same authorities uh, as we go ahead and complete the drawdown over the summer. So we, we still have the authority uh, uh, to assist the Afghans in the field if they need it. Can you give some specific examples of how that might be conducted? Without uh, I think the way you've seen it, the way you've seen it uh, being conducted in the past, uh, through through airstrikes. Okay. Follow up um, on the the original mission to to fight Al Qaeda and uh, ISIS uh, as an extension. How do you see their threat? Are the are either of these groups adding strength or becoming more active as the U.S. pulls out? Uh, how do you assess their threat right now? Not going to get into intelligence assessments. Uh, clearly, there are Al Qaeda elements still in Afghanistan, as are ISIS elements, um, and we are watching this very, very closely. Uh, I, I again won't talk about a specific intelligence assessment, but uh, we're going to monitor this going forward. And as the secretary has made clear, uh, we have now and will be able to retain uh, 
over the horizon counterterrorism capability uh, such that if we see threats emanating from Afghanistan that uh, directly against the homeland, we'll be able to take action. Yeah, in the back there. Yeah. Thank you. Um, the combined neighbor exercise, joint military exercise, is now uh, has started this week in Indo-Pacific region. Uh, so the, the Pacific Vanguard, and then there will be um, talisman saver uh, soon. So this could be a, a follow-up question. But um, can I say that this is de facto targeting China uh, in the event of a conflict with China or Taiwan? So can uh, you we, elaborate more we on We routinely the exercise our capabilities across joint and combined units uh, uh, all the time to improve our capability as well as improve interoperability with our allies and partners. Uh, and no one should take away from these exercises that they're pointed in any one specific uh, uh, potential adversary or even any one specific threat. It, it's not at all uncommon for us to conduct these joint and multinational exercises. Now see we um, now we see that some European allies like uh, France and UK also like join in, in the joint military uh, naval exercise in the Pacific. So do you think or do, do you have any plan to um, expand uh, the countries who uh, join the, the military exercise in in the Pacific region? I point you to Indo PACOM for more specifics about their exercise uh, regimen. I, I don't have that level of detail. We we certainly welcome. Uh, multinational partners to, to join in these exercises. It's obviously a sovereign decision that each country has to make for itself, uh, whether it wants to participate. And again, we wouldn't speak for them, but I, I'd, I'd point you to Indo-PACOM for more detail about uh, the multinational component of these exercises. Uh, Paul Schinkman. Yeah, hi, John. Thanks for doing this. There's been a lot of skepticism about the extent to which the U.S. could redeploy to Afghanistan as it did to Iraq in 2014. Um, particularly whether it would have the support of nearby countries. Does the department believe that it could reenter Afghanistan if it felt that it needed to? Uh, it's, uh, Paul, that's a hypothetical that uh, I'm just not prepared to engage uh, today on. Uh, our mission, our focus right now is on completing this drawdown in a safe and orderly way, transitioning to a new relationship uh, with, uh, with Afghan forces. And again, uh, the president has been very clear that we are going to to be able to maintain and retain uh, a, a, a counterterrorism capability commensurate with whatever threat might emanate out of Afghanistan towards the homeland, uh, and that we have now, and that we'll continue to pursue robust over-the-horizon uh, abilities uh, to to meet that commitment. Um, I guess I have time for one more. Uh, Sam Legrone. John, um, just uh, to go back to the uh, idea of disinformation, uh, within the last couple, three weeks in the Black Sea, uh, in the lead up to Sea Breeze and during the exercise, we've seen um, falsified AIS data for two NATO warships and the USS Ross, all positioning them in, in relatively what could be considered controversial positions off of Crimea. Uh, are y'all in the department concerned that this level of disinformation is, is putting sailors at risk in the Black Sea as they're conducting these operations? And is there any plans to kind of police this space in the future? Thank you. Uh, Sam, I'm not going to speak to the details of, uh, of the reports you're, you're talking about. What I would tell you is that this exercise is happening and occurring in international uh, waters in accordance with international law. Uh, it's a defensive exercise, um, and it's one of the most robust uh, sea breeze exercises we've conducted to date, and we're proud of that. Uh, and we're proud of the interoperability and the capability that is showing that, uh, that, that uh, we can have with international partners in that inter international uh, uh, seaway. Uh, and again, we'll continue to read out uh, the exercise and, uh, and make it as transparent as we can. Okay. Sure, John. But it's, it's, not about, it's not about the exercise itself. It's the fact that there's someone out there that are falsifying the positions of U.S. and allied warships in ways that look provocative. I mean, it's beyond the exercise itself. I mean, and it's looking at a, a piece of information that's out there that a lot of people use to rely on to, to understand what's going on in the maritime just from the merchant. Um, so I, I'm just curious... Uh, if the department is concerned about this level of disinformation, not only just from a, a maritime, just from a maritime security standpoint. Thank you. Well, 
our security at sea is, uh, is vital to us, um, and, uh, and clearly we're concerned um, about uh, uh, any information out there that could put uh, our people, our ships, our sailors at, at greater risk. I'm just not going to uh, get into the specifics uh, in, in terms of this particular issue you're, you're talking about, but clearly we're always concerned about safety and security first. Okay, thanks.